So I want to finish this video by doing an example of showing that a function is Riemann integrable and finding the value of the Riemann integral from the formal definition. So the function that we're going to consider is f of x is equal to x squared, a nice simple function. And the interval that we're going to integrate over is going to be the interval 0, 1. So drawing a picture here. Here is our interval 0, 1, and then the function f of x is equal to x squared will look something like that on the interval 0, 1. And intuitively, this should have an area under the curve, so it should be Riemann integrable, we hope. That's what we're now going to formally show. Now, before we do that, let's just cheat. Let's use calculus for a moment to actually find what the area under this curve should be so that we know what answer we're trying to get from our formal definition. So if we want to integrate x squared from 0 to 1, then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we haven't proven for Riemann integration yet, but which we are going towards in later videos in this playlist on uh, real analysis, we will prove that the Riemann integral obeys the fundamental theorem of calculus, but for now we'll just use it. So we find the antiderivative 2x squared, which is x cubed over 3, and then if we evaluate it at 1 and take away what it is at 0, that will give us the area under the curve, so of course that's just equal to 1 third. So that's the value of that area under the curve, that's the value of the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx. So what we now want to do is do this formally, formally show that x squared is Riemann integrable on this interval from 0 to 1 and find that value of the Riemann integral. So if it's going to be Riemann integrable, we need to show that the supremum of the lower Riemann sums is equal to the infimum of the upper Riemann sums, and we need to find that value of the supremum and the infimum because that's going to be the value of the integral, and we need to hope that it's going to come out as a third. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this by considering a good choice of dissection, and the dissection that we're going to choose is going to be an even dissection where we chop it up into equal sized pieces, and we'll chop it up into progressively more and more pieces, and we'll call the number of pieces that we're chopping it up to n, as usual. So our interval 0, 1, then, is going to be chopped up into n equal sized pieces, so if we set n equal to 1, it would just be the entire interval. If we set n equal to 2, it would be that. n equal 3, n equal 4 would look something like that. And we're going to consider what would the upper Riemann sum over these dissections be equal to, and what would the lower Riemann sum over these dissections be equal to. So let's start upper Riemann su sum over d, and we'll call it d subscript n. So it's the nth one has chopped it up into n equal size pieces of our function x squared. What's this going to be equal to it? So it's going to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n. And now each of the intervals is going to have an equal length, and it's going to have length 1 divided by n. Because the whole interval has length 1, we've divided it up into n pieces. So each little portion, sub-interval, is going to have length 1 over n. So the length part of the Riemann, upper Riemann sum it, we can replace with 1 over n, which is nice because previously we would have had xi minus xi minus 1, which was a mess. But now it's constant for all the i's, so we can just replace it with this. And then we need times the supremum of the value of this function, which is x squared, over the interval, which is going to be now... Let's think what is xi actually going to be equal to. So it's going to equal, if we think this is x0 here, this is x1 here. So xi, x, x1 is equal to 1 over n. xi is equal to 0. x2 is going to be 2 over n. The reason I know this is because each of these intervals is length 1 over n, so the first cutting point is going to be 1 over n, the second cutting point is going to be 2 over n, etc. So in general, xi is going to equal i over n. So xi is equal to i over n. So um, it's actually 
the supremum of the interval x is equal to uh, from x i minus 1 to x i. So it's going to be i minus 1 over n to i over n, like so. So when i is equal to 1, you'll have 0 here to 1 over n, which will be the first subinterval. Uh, when i is equal to 2, you'll have 1 over n to 2 over n. When i is equal to n, you'll have n minus 1 over n up to 1. So that's the correct thing to have there. Now, we know something about the function f of x is equal to x squared. It's strictly increasing. So as you go to bigger values, x squared gets bigger. So if x2 is greater than x1, you know that x2 squared is going to be greater than x1 squared. Formally, the way you'd show that is uh, just using some of the ordered field properties of the real numbers. So both of these are, of course, positive numbers. So we can multiply both sides by either of them. So if we take this inequality here, x2 is greater than x1, and multiply both sides by x2, you'll get x2 squared is greater than x2 times x1. Now take the same inequality and multiply both sides by x1, and you'll get x2 times x1 is greater than x1 squared. And then you can apply transitivity to say x2 squared is greater than x1 squared. So if you take an x2 in this interval that is greater than x1, you know that its squared is also going to be greater than x1 squared. So it's a strictly increasing function. So the supremum of the value of the function over this interval is actually going to be the value of the function at the most rightward point, the biggest point. So this interval from i minus 1 to n, for, sorry, from i minus 1 over n to i over n will have lots of different values of f over it, but it's getting bigger. As you go higher in this interval to the higher part, the value of the function is going to get bigger, and the biggest value it's going to take, indeed the supremum over the interval, is going to be the value at i over n. So actually, this becomes simpler. The upper Riemann sum for our dissection dn of our function f is going to equal the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of, and then it's going to be i over n squared. That's now replaced this supremum bit. And of course, we're still going to have the 1 over n which is the length of the interval. Now, the n is a constant, so we can pull out the 1 over n cubed here, and we'll just then be left with sum from i is equal to 1 to n of i squared. And that's the value of the upper Riemann sum for a given dissection dn. So it's going to be a function overall of n, because you can make n equal to 1, you can make n equal to 2, n equal to 3, and of course it's going to get better and better as you make n bigger and bigger. Now let's go a little bit further. What is this sum here? Well this is a formula that I hope you're familiar with previously. So if you have something like this, sum from i is equal to 1 to n of i squared, there is a formula for that. It's a cubic formula. You can derive it, hopefully you've seen the derivation of it previously. You can derive it using calculus finite differences, that's probably the best way. Alternatively, you could derive it by cubic interpolation. So because you know it's a cubic formula, if you know that bit already, that it's going to be a cubic expression, and you know that because someone else has worked it out through calculus of finite differences. But if you know it's a cubic formula, you can take the first four values that you want to be correct. So for instance, if n is equal to one, you want the sum to equal one. If n is equal to 2, you want the sum to be 1 plus 2 squared, which is 4, so 5. For n is equal to 3, you want it to be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, which will be 5 plus 9, which is 3 squared, so that the, and you want it to be 14. For n is equal to 4, you want it to be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, so add on 4 squared, 16, to 14, and you'll get 30. So if you take those values, there's only one cubic expression that can be guaranteed to go through those points correctly. Uh, so you can use cubic interpolation to find that one formula, and then that 
is the formula that works then for all n's as well. Uh, that would require proof. You prove it then by proof by induction. Um, but that's another way that you could derive this formula. Anyway, we're not going to go through the derivations of the formula. We're just going to write the formula out. So it's n over 6 times 2n plus 1 times n plus 1. So we can now replace the sum from i is equal to 1, i squared, all the way up to n is uh, with this expression. So it's going to be 1 over n cubed times this thing, n over 6, 2n plus 1, n plus 1. And now let's cancel some of the n's, because n is never going to equal 0, so we can cancel it. So we'll get 1 sixth, and then, so that's one of the n's cancelled with this n here. Now let's bring one of the n's into here and cancel. So we'll get times 2 plus 1 over n, and then let's bring the final n into the final bracket, so we'll get 1 plus 1 over n. So that, then, is the value of the upper Riemann sum over one of these dissections, one of these equally spaced dissections with n pieces, and it's a function of n. So you just stick in whatever n you choose. So if you choose n is equal to 20, that means you've divided that interval 0, 1 into 20 equal pieces. The value of the upper Riemann sum that you'll get for that dissection is given by this formula. Stick in 20 here. Brilliant. Now, before we use that formula to make some conclusion, we need to find a formula for the lower Riemann sum over one of these dissections. So we want the lower Riemann sum over our dissection dn of our function f. So this is going to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n. And again, the length of the intervals is 1 over n. Now it's going to be the infimum of the value of the function over the corresponding interval, which is still the interval i minus 1 over n to i over n. Now again, because of the fact that the function is strictly increasing, the infimum, the smallest possible value, is actually obtained, and it will be the value at this left end point of the interval. So we need to put this thing squared this time. So this is going to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of 1 over n times i minus 1 over n squared. So again, we can pull out the 1 over n cubed, and we're then going to get the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of i minus 1 squared. Well, we can rewrite that as the sum from i is equal to 0 to n minus 1 of i squared. Because if you think about this, if you're just subtracting 1, then you might as well just move down all the things that you're summing over by 1. So move 1 down to 0, 2 down to 1, all the way up to n being moved down to n minus 1. So this is the same as this. Now, of course, you don't need to bother including i is equal to 0, because when you put in i is equal to 0, 0 squared is just 0, so that doesn't contribute anything to the sum. So we might as well get rid of that 0 there and replace it with a 1. And now we can apply our formula again um, for uh, the sum of the squares of numbers. Uh, so that expression up there. We just now need to put in n minus 1 for n. So we're going to get 1 over n squared, sorry, n cubed, times n minus 1 over 6, and then 2n minus 1, so we'll get 2n. The minus 1 will times by the 2 to give us minus 2, plus 1 will then give us minus 1, and then we'll have times n there. Let's do a little bit of cancellation now. So one of those ends cancels beautifully with this end, and then let's bring the other ends to cancel with those brackets. So we're still going to get 1 sixth. Then we're going to get 2 minus 1 over n. I'm trying to put it in analogous positions. I'm bringing this one into this position, so everything tallies up with this. So we've divided through by n, and we've got 2 minus 1 over n. And now let's bring this bit over to here. So we'll then get 1 minus 1 over n. So again, this is a formula that gives you the lower Riemann sum for one of these special dissections where the pieces are all of equal size, and it is a formula that, give, that is in terms of n. So you give me a number, little n, that you want to split that interval into, and then you plug it in here and it will give you the lower Riemann sum. So these formulas are fantastic. So this is the lower Riemann sum over dn, 
of f, and this is the upper Riemann sum here over dn of f. Now you can see what happens. As n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you can see that these are going to converge on something. So formally, what we can do is we can use our knowledge of sequences to help us here. So if we consider having these things as sequences, so let's, for instance, consider this one here as a sequence from n is equal to 1 to infinity, and consider the limit of that sequence, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 1 sixth, 2 minus 1 over n, times 1 uh, minus 1 over n, then we can apply the algebra of limits that we know works. So we can split this into the fact that it's 1 sixth, we can pull that out, and then it's the limit of this times the limit of this. We also know what the limit of 1 over n is. It's 0. So that means that this thing's limit, uh, these sums, we can also apply the algebra of limits to, we'll get that it's the limit of this plus the limit of this, and this one will be the limit of this plus the limit of this. So overall, you can see that this is going to come out as a sixth times this thing's limit is 2, and this thing's limit is 1, so it's going to be 1, so it's going to be a third. Oh, look, that magic value is coming up. Do the same thing for this one. Its limit is, again, going to be a sixth times the limit of this, which is 2, times the limit of this, which is 1. So again, it's going to be a third. Now, what, why am I using, why am I thinking suddenly of these as sequences and using this? Well, all I'm doing is giving you a formal justification for why I know that as n gets bigger and bigger, this is going to get indefinitely close to a third. And it's the same for this one. This one gets indefinitely close to a third, and this one gets indefinitely close to a third as n gets bigger. And the reason I can say that formally is because now imagine them as sequences. I can use the algebra of limits to find the limit, and I know that that's what the concept of convergence of a sequence means. It means that it gets and stays indefinitely close to the value of the limit. So I can now conclude that for certain values of n, I can get as indefinitely close as you like to a third for these. Now what I'm going to do is use that to show that the supremum of the lower Riemann sums and must equal the infimum of the upper Riemann sums. So these, of course, are not all possible dissections. These are very special dissections. These will be inside these great sets. So we are thinking now about these incredible great sets, the set of all possible lower Riemann sums and the set of all possible upper Riemann sums. And we want to show that the supremum of this set is equal to the infimum of this set. All of these values are inside this set and all of these values are inside this set. And look, those ones are getting indefinitely close to a third and these ones from above are coming down to get indefinitely close to a third. I want to somehow use that to show the supremum of this must equal the infimum of this. So hopefully it's obvious to you that the reason that that's going to be true is that both of them have to be a third. So let's show that. So if we just have a picture here, let's have a number line and have a third here. My claim is a third must be the infimum of this set and it must be the supremum of this set. So let's start by showing that it must be the infimum of the set of all the upper Riemann sums. So firstly, let's prove that it must be a lower bound, because to be an infimum, it must be a lowest bound, and then it must also be the greatest of the lowest bound, of the lower bounds. So let's firstly show it's a lower bound. Well, if it were not a lower bound, then that would mean that there would have to be some upper Riemann sum in this set that was strictly less than it. So we can now put that on the picture. So let's say this is that upper Riemann sum that happens to be strictly less than a third. The problem is that I've shown you that for these lower Riemann sums, they get indefinitely close to a third. Now, there is a closeness here. Measure that difference between that upper Riemann sum and a third. That has a length. It might have a tiny length, but it has some length. I know that these specific lower Riemann sums here get indefinitely close to a third. So I can find one that is closer to a third than that green length there. So I can find you a lower Riemann sum, one of these special lower Riemann sums, my d 
dn lower Riemann sum. So I can find you an n here such that it's, in, we, it's closer to a third than this blue one here. But that now is a problem because we now have this lower Riemann sum here that is greater than this upper Riemann sum here. And we know that that cannot happen. We know that all lower Riemann sums over any dissection is always less than or equal to any upper Riemann sum over any other dissection D2. So that would contradict that because we would have a lower Riemann sum that's actually bigger than one of the upper Riemann sums. So that means there cannot possibly exist an upper Riemann sum that is strictly less than a third, and hence a third must be a lower bound on the set of all upper Riemann sums. Now let's prove that it is the greatest lower bound. So to prove that, we just have to prove that nothing greater than it can be a lower bound. So if we, again, do a proof by contradiction, suppose that you had some number that was strictly greater than a third, we'll call that L, and that this is proposed to be a lower bound of this set of all upper Riemann sums. That cannot possibly be the case because I have shown that these upper Riemann sums, these special upper Riemann sums over my dn dissections, they get indefinitely close to a third. I've convinced you of that already. So again, there is a distance here between a third and an L, that little L distance. I can again find you some upper Riemann sum, one of these special upper Riemann sums, a dn upper Riemann sum, such that it is closer to a third than that L distance, that distance between a third and an L. And therefore, that would contradict L being a lower bound of the set of all upper Riemann sums, because this is an upper Riemann sum, and it would be strictly less than L. So it would contradict L being a, a, a lower bound. Hence, I've shown you that nothing that is strictly greater than a third can be a lower bound, and therefore a third must be the greatest lower bound. So I've shown it's a lower bound, and I've shown that nothing greater than it can be a lower bound, hence it is the greatest lower bound. So I've proven to you then that the infimum of all of the upper Riemann sums must equal a third. The argument for why it must be the supremum of the lower Riemann sums is the same thing, but in reverse. So we'll draw a fresh picture for this. So here is a third. So firstly, we want to show that a third is an upper bound of all of the lower Riemann sums. And again, we'll do it by proof by contradiction. So suppose it wasn't an upper bound for the lower Riemann sums. That would mean that there was a lower Riemann sum that was strictly greater than it, which I'll put here. Now, why can that not happen? Because of the fact that these special upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to a third. So again, there is a distance there between a third and that lower Riemann sum. And I will be able to find you one of these special upper Riemann sums over these equal dissections, so UDN, such that it is closer than that distance between a third and that lower Riemann sum. And then that's a contradiction because now we have an upper Riemann sum that is strictly less than a lower Riemann sum contradicting this. So it cannot be the case that a third is not an upper bound. It cannot be the case that there is a lower Riemann sum that is greater than a third. So a third therefore is an upper bound of the set of all upper of the set of all lower Riemann sums. Now what we want to show is that it is the least upper bound. So we want to show that if you take any number that's smaller than it, that that cannot possibly be an upper bound. So take this number here, which we'll call u, and propose that to be an upper bound, and we'll find a contradiction. So if it were an upper bound, then that would mean that all the lower Riemann sums would have to be less than it. But of course, that can't be the case, because we know that these special lower Riemann sums over these dn intervals get indefinitely close to a third. So again, there is a closeness here. There's a distance between u and a third, and I will be able to find you one of these lower Riemann sums over a dissection dn such that it is closer to a third than that distance between u and a third, which would then mean that this one is strictly greater than u, contradicting u being an upper bound for the set of all lower Riemann sums, as this is certainly in that set of lower Riemann sums. 
Hence, we have proven that a third must be an upper bound for this set of all lower Riemann sums, and that no number smaller than it can be uh, an upper bound. So it is the least upper bound, hence it is the supremum. So the supremum of the set of all lower Riemann sums is equal to a third. Hence, it is true that the supremum of all the lower Riemann sums is equal to the infimum of all the upper Riemann sums, and that value is equal to a third, so the function x squared is Riemann integrable on the interval 0, 1, and the value is equal to the value of the supremum, is equal to the value of the infimum, is equal to a third, which agrees with the result that we had previously from calculus. So this all seems to be working fantastically. Before we finish, I would just like to demonstrate how the Dirichlet function that we mentioned earlier is not going to be Riemann integrable. So just to remind you of this function, we'll consider it just on the interval 0, 1, and it's an indicator function. It maps the rational numbers onto 1 and the irrational numbers onto 0. And we saw how intuitively this is much more difficult to decide whether it has an area under the curve or not. And we'll see now how our formal definition of Riemann integration is not going to allow this to be integrable. So if you consider the interval, 0, 1 here, and then let's just consider a random dissection, which for an easy picture I will draw as just having four pieces. If you now consider the upper Riemann sum for our Dirichlet function over that dissection, what is this going to equal? Well, we need to take, for each of these intervals, we need to take the length of the interval, and then we need to multiply it by the supremum of the value of the function over that interval. Now, any interval you take in the real line is always going to contain a rational number. We proved that in earlier videos in the playlist on real analysis. So that means that in every single one of these intervals, the function is going to obtain the value 1. And that's the maximum value this function can ever obtain. So the supremum of the value of the function over all the values of the domain in any one of these intervals is always going to equal 1. Therefore, we're going to get 1 times the length of each one of these intervals being added up to make the upper Riemann sum, and that, hopefully you understand, is overall going to come out as 1 times 1. It's going to be equal to 1 when you add them all together, because you're going to be taking this length here, which I'll show in red, this length here, you're going to be multiplying that by 1 to get the area of that rectangle, you're going to be taking this length here, multiplying that by 1, etc., so overall, you're just going to get a rectangle here. This side is going to be 1, and this side is also going to be 1. So the upper Riemann sum is going to come out as 1, and that's true no matter what dissection you take, no matter how refined you make it, no matter how many cuts you put in here, every single one of the little intervals that you've partitioned the overall interval into will always have a rational number in, and therefore the supremum of the value of the function over that interval will be 1. So it's always going to be 1 no matter what d is equal to. Now let's consider the lower Riemann sum over any dissection d of f. Well, the same argument now applies here. For any interval in this partition that you've cut the interval up into by the dissection is always going to contain an irrational number and therefore is always going to obtain the value 0. The function is always going to obtain the value 0 over every single one of these little intervals that you've chopped the overall interval up into. That's the smallest value the function can possibly take, so that's going to be the infimum. So the infimum that you're going to be multiplying the length of all the intervals by is always going to be 0. Therefore, you're multiplying every one of the lengths of the intervals by 0. 0 times anything is just 0. So you're adding together a whole bunch of zeros and you're going to come out as just zero. Pictorially, what you're doing is you're taking this length, you're multiplying it by zeros, so you're getting a, no rectangle at all, really, just a line. Here, you're taking this length, multiplying it by zero, this length, multiplying it by zero, this length, 
multiplying it by zero, because over every single one of those intervals, the function will obtain the value zero, because there's always going to be an irrational number in every single one of those intervals. Therefore, effectively, you're just multiplying the whole length one by zero, which is zero. So that, again, is going to hold true over whatever dissection you take, no matter how fine you make it, it's still going to be the case that every single one of those intervals you partition the overall interval up into will have, the va have an irrational number in it, and therefore the function will obtain the value zero in that interval, and that will be the infimum of the value of the function. So actually, for this Dirichlet function, the set of all upper Riemann sums and the set of all lower Riemann sums are actually incredibly simple. They're finite sets. The set of all possible values you can get for the lower Riemann sum is just the set containing one value, which is zero, and the set of all possible values that you can get for upper Riemann sums over every single dissection is just one, and you can see that the supremum of that set is clearly zero, the infimum of that set is one, so they don't equal one another, ergo this function is not Riemann integrable over the interval zero, one. So we'll end there. Uh, thank you for watching. We will continue the topic of Riemann integration and see further theorems about this in subsequent videos in the playlist on real analysis. So if you want to watch the follow-up to this, go to my playlist on real analysis.